Hello, welcome to this long lecture on genome editing. Uh, the lectures mostly intended for university students, uh, researchers, clinicians and, and uh, the media who are quite new to genome editing and, and want a, a good background in it. Um, I cover things like zinc finger nucleases and talons all the way through to CRISPR and the latest um, CRISPR methods like prime editing. So it's quite a long lecture. If you look in the description you'll see timestamps for um, each section which you can skip to or play again. Also I've broken this lecture down into smaller pieces um, if you're just interested in a specific thing like CRISPR or, or, or prime editing or something like that. Um, on the slides you'll see numbers and circles in the bottom right hand corner. Um, those are for the references that I've used um, to create um, this lecture. So some of the graphics that you see come from those papers and reviews. Um, but I'm mostly giving you that list of references um, as, a, as the best starting point that I can see uh, for you to continue your own reading. Um, so in the description you'll see all of those references uh, with links to those papers and journal sites. Um, be aware that some of those will not be open access um, so you'll need your institutional uh, licenses to see those articles unless you want to pay. Um, so I hope you enjoy it and let's get started. In this lecture I'm going to cover the following sections. Each of these sections is time stamped in the description so you can jump straight to those sections or you can go back and watch a particular section again later on if you want to just revise what you've heard. Um, alternatively each of these sections will get broken up into very short videos later on if you've just got an interest in one particular area. So before I get into details on the different kinds of nucleases, in the introduction I'll just revise hopefully what you already know about double strand DNA break repair. And we'll look at the kinds of genome editing outcomes that you could achieve using sequence specific nucleases. Then I'll move on to um, describing zinc finger nucleases and the pros and cons of those. And then I'll move on to talons. And then we'll move on to CRISPR. And before we get into how CRISPR is used for genome editing, we'll describe um, the natural adaptive immune systems that CRISPR belongs to because it explains some of the issues of uh, CRISPR specificity. Um, then we'll get into what CRISPR-Cas9 is and how it's used. Um, and then the longest section will be spent on CRISPR specificity uh, and the, the advanced methods that are out there to overcome um, the limitations of CRISPR. Um, and in the last section, we'll talk about precision editing, where you want to make very specific edits um, and you need um, absolute control over what you're doing. And there's two areas of that, um, homology directed repair and prime editing. Genome editing describes the ability to modify the DNA genomes of living organisms in controllable ways. So that's modifying in living cells, in living species, rather than taking a piece of DNA out, modifying it with some enzymes, growing it up in bacteria, then put it back again. We're actually modifying in living cells, so in the case of humans, in human cells. Genome editing is critical to the study of genes and gene regula regulatory element functions. So rather than to understand the gene, <clears throat> you take it out of a cell and you study it somewhere else, or you're studying, studying a gene regulatory element like a promoter or an enhancer, and you put that into some kind of reporter assay. With genome editing, you can study a gene or a gene regulatory element in its natural context, its chromosomal context. So you can delete it, mutate it, exchange it, modify it, however you want to, in its natural context. This is very powerful. 
Genome editing also paves the way for the creation of models for human disease. So you can take the specific mutations that occur in the human population and put them into cell lines or into animal models um, to try and mimic the disease and study very specific molecular aspects of that disease and gain some insight, maybe develop some drugs and test them out. Genome editing also obviously uh, allows for the advanced correction of genetic diseases. So these are advanced gene therapies. So rather than when you've got um, a patient who's got a defective gene, rather than overlaying that with a normal gene, and so those cells in that patient express both the normal and the mutant gene, you can now actually try and correct the mutant gene and get rid of the problems of that mutant gene. Genome editing also um, allows for very um, powerful improvements in the biotechnology and food production sectors. So you could modify uh, microbes or plants to, to make better products for you or be resistant to diseases or easier to handle, whatever it is that's lim limiting in those industries. Um, genome edi editing can now be uh, applied um, should it be safe to do so. Prior to genome editing, uh, a method called gene targeting was used um, um, to, to modify um, genomes. Um, this describes the genetic replacement um, based on cellular homologous recombination machinery. Um, so this is obviously used in yeast an awful lot. Uh, it can be used in mammalian embryonic stem cells and in B cells. But in general, it's very inefficient in most cell types of interest. And for all those applications list listed above, gene targeting just um, it, it is just not useful in most situations. So genome editing involves um, a variety of powerful synthetic biology strategies um, that have been developed to create sequence-specific DNA endonucleases. So these are enzymes that cut a specific DNA sequence uh, of your choosing. Uh, and you, you place those endonucleases um, to, to create the cut exactly where you want to. So if you're trying to knock out a gene, it's going to cut at your specific gene. This then stimulates cellular DNA repair. And DNA repair in fixing that break um, will either make mistakes or you can uh, persuade it and trick it into making specific changes. So the combination of your knowledge of DNA repair and your ability to create these enzymes that will cut where you want them to, you can then modify a target genetic locus precisely and quickly. This is a very, very quick method. So there have been three generations of nucleases that have been created for the use in gene of uh, <clears throat> for their use in genome editing. <clears throat> um, the first um, version um, involved zinc finger nucleases, so sh I shall take you through those. Then um, a better approach came along, um, which are the tail nucleases or talons. But in this most modern era, in the last few years. CRISPR really has become uh, the easy, easiest and most applicable uh, method out there. So I'll take you through each of these three things. It's important to consider zinc finger nucleases and tail nucleases and understand them because those are the ones that have made it through to um, clinical trials uh, and a lot of biotech um, applications. So it's important to know what they actually are and what their value is. So looking at double strand break repair pathways, um, so I'm mostly um, going to focus the talk on mammalian systems, but a lot of this is true across eukaryotes. The most dominant pathway of DNA break repair um, is called non-homologous end joining. It's a very fast uh, set of enzymatic processes which simply join breaks back together again and they ignore the sequence at those breaks. So if you've got multiple breaks present, potentially different ends will get joined to each other. Um, but also um, when joining the correct ends together, um, it can do so in, a, in an error-prone way. So on the left is a diagram here 
of the typical kinds of factors that recognize the brakes, signal the brakes, and then start to um, fill in any ends which aren't blunt and then ligate them together. This kind of repair can be completed in minutes. It's extremely error prone because no template copy is used. And canonical non-homologous end joining can be accurate if, if the ends are, are, are blunt um, and phosphorylated and clean. Um, it can join them back together the way they came apart and it's fine. But if you're using one of these nucleases in genome editing, it's gonna cut that site again because you've reinstated the target sequence. And what will happen eventually is that non-homologous end joining will insert an extra base to facilitate the ligation of the ends. And in which case you've got one base insertion, you've changed the sequence that might inactivate a gene. Um, alternative non uh, uh, alternative um, end joining pathways typically reset the five prime ends at the breaks, so they chew just that one strand back, uh, so five prime to three prime resection. And what they're doing is exposing a short sequence, a single-stranded sequence, to look for local microhomology. So it might just be a couple of A's or a couple of C's, and it will join those to a couple of T's or a couple of G's on the, on the other end, um, and it will ligate through that. So um, those will pair up, and there may be bases that will need to be removed. Um, and so often you get these local deletions. Um, so collectively you get insertions or deletions from non-homologous end joining, and we call them indels for short. And so the outcome of this kind of repair pathway is seemingly random. Um, so if you're trying to create a, a knockout of your favorite gene by targeting a nuclease at the beginning of the gene, then this dominant non-homologous end joining pathways is excellent for creating all these seemingly random mutations and you'll get frame shift mutations in there and you'll get a, a loss of gene expression very, very easily. Um, but actually when people look um, at lots and lots of targets and, and, and repeat uh, genome editing in lots of cells, they find that actually the kind of edits that occur from non-homologous end joining are not random and and to some degree that they're based on the local sequence context so you'll see at some sites you always get plus one insertions at other sites you always get deletions of a particular length because of the local micro homology A slower but accurate uh, DNA break repair pathway is called homology directed repair. Uh, and this is an enzymatic process that uses a, a, a normal biology, uh, the sister chromatid template for accurate repair. So obviously this is normally associated with DNA replication. So if you've got a stalled replication fork, uh, sometimes the, the system will, will actually cut that fork, create a DNA break, and because you've got a local template available, you can then copy that. So there are a set of pro proteins that recognize those breaks, um, resect, uh, so a key part of homology directed repair is very extensive five prime to three prime resection um, at the break, which exposes a long three prime overhang. This is typically many kilobases in length this um, three prime break is then um, protected with proteins like uh, um, replication protein A. So they protect their single stranded DNA binding proteins. They protect these three prime ends. They then get exchanged with RAD51, this um, fantastic filament protein. And in combination with the BRCA proteins, these filaments are able to then invade and search a sister copy for a matching sequence. And when it does so, it base pairs up and a strand exchange occurs. Uh, and so you get these holiday junctions where you've got a crossover between um, one chromatid and another. Uh, and then these are resolved and the gaps are filled in. And so what you end up with is, is, is a perfect copy um, from one sister chromatid to another. So this process overall um, can take over an hour depending on the sequence so it's quite slow 
it's limited to a very specific part of the cell cycle. Um, but potentially we could use this in genome editing um, to persuade the cell to make a specific change for us. But instead of um, having a sister chromatid as the copy, we would deliver a donor DNA. And that donor could be a plasmid or, or a viral genome that we've introduced into cells. And we do so in excess if we can. And so uh, the exchange of the sequence we're interested in becomes the, the dominant event. So a key thing about considering what's going to happen after you create a DNA break is that you've got this error-prone pathway and then you've got this accurate pathway and they're active at different times in the cell cycle. So non-homologous end joining is, is functional throughout the cell cycle. Um, certainly it's very dominant in G1 and S phase, uh, um, you know, which is where most of your genome editing is going to be occurring. HDR, on the other hand, is linked to replication, so it's only active when uh, DNA replication is occurring um, throughout S phase, but it accumulates late in S phase. And then in G2, particularly G2 is where a lot of these stalled forks are getting resolved. So if your goal is to undertake destructive gene editing, like creating a gene knockout, then it's very easy. Um, because non-homologous end joining is dominant and you're going to get a lot of cells where, which are, are going to have mutations which are useful to you in that they create frame shifts and that inactivate your gene. If your goal is to under, undertake a, a, an accurate DNA edit, so you're doing gene correction or a specific mutation in a gene regulatory element, you're creating a specific model, um, then somehow you need to deal with all the unwanted non-homologous end joining mutations and you've got to sift through all of this junk to find the cells which have the specific edits that you're interested in. And this is a, a, a hidden um, problem of genome editing that, that a, a lot of people perhaps don't consider when they first get started. So... In this slide here, I'm going to show you um, in, in very simplified terms uh, the possible genome editing outcomes you can get just from creating um, DNA breaks using sequence-specific nucleases. So in these cartoons, we've got two strands representing DNA, and, and then this, this cut through here just shows a DNA break that um, we have introduced with our nuclease. So if we just cut in a place of interest so that's a promoter, uh, early exons of a gene, then we get insertions and deletions occur because of non-homologous end joining, and so we can disrupt that gene's function or that regulatory element's function. If we um, provide uh, a donor DNA at the same time, so that could be a linear piece of DNA, or it could be a plasmid which we are going to cut at either end, uh, with our nucleases at the same time as cutting our genomic target, then without any um, special homology arms or special processes, so this is just using non-homologous end joining, you will get insertion of your uh, sequence of interest. It's nearly always a transgene, um, so I've coloured it green here in case it's, it could be a, a GFP transgene, say. Um, and you will get insertion at that target site. But a key thing is that you've got no control over the orientation of that insertion. It can go in either way. And also the ends either side of the insertion um, will be uh, will have these indels on them. So, so you may lose or gain sequences. So if it's important for you to, uh, for example, in the case of perhaps you wanted to, to uh, tag the C terminus of a, of a gene uh, and create a GFP fusion or, or a a fusion of, of, of another long tag. In that case, your insertion needs to be the correct orientation and it needs to be in the correct open reading frame as your gene. And with this kind of approach, very few of your cells are going to achieve that. Um, but potentially, for example, in the case of a GFP fusion, you can, you can easily select for those cells. So if it's very inefficient knock-in and very inefficient at creating the, the correct knock-in, um, those cells are still bright green, so you'll be able to 
um, sort them out through flow cytometry, for example. So it depends on your application. Sometimes you can just do it this very simple, quick way. Alternatively, you could make quite large genomic rearrangements um, just by cutting twice. So let's say you've got a gene locus which you want to invert for some reason. You can just cut either side of it and the cell when repairing those breaks may put that insert back into its normal location but do so the wrong way around. And obviously alternatively, probably more dominantly, um, you will lose that fragment and you'll end up with a deletion. So that's just simply cutting with two nucleases at the same time, no other tricks. So a small percentage of cells will make these big edits for you. And we have done this. We, we've, we've deleted out several genes from a gene cluster um, just by cutting twice and not doing anything else. And you get a decent number of cells that uh, have made that edit for you and, and you can do some experiments on them. Alternatively, you, you, you may want to persuade the cell to use homology-directed repair for you. So, for example, let's say we want to knock in a gene at a specific location. Um, so, in this case, we're going to cut the target locus with our nuclease. So, that's the target locus here. And then you'll have a donor fragment which contains the sequence you want to insert. But importantly, that fragment has to be flanked by homology arms which are the same sequences as what's found at the either side of the break at the genomic target. So this sequence here would be placed here, this sequence here would be placed there, and um, strand, strand exchange would be used, um, uh, would occur using these homology arms. Um, and in the case of, of, of sort of traditional HDR, where you're knocking in large gene fragments, um, you need at least 750 bases uh, in lens for that homology arm, and the longer the better. Alternatively, um, you may just want to make um, precise edits. So let's say you've got um, a defective gene and you're wanting to correct it with the real gene. Um, you would cut as close as possible to the, the where you want the change to occur. Um, and then you'd have a, a donor fragment again, like you've seen on the left here, with these homology arms. So if you're wanting to exchange a, a, a large gene sequence, then you do need these long homology arms. But let's say you're just making um, an edit of one, two, or three bases, um, as is typical for most human genetic diseases, then it's been shown that your donor fragment can actually be very short indeed. So actually now people use oligonucleotides, so very short, uh, single-stranded DNA fragments. You, you only need one strand, which will have the edit, which may be one, two or three bases. And then that can just be flanked by 40 bases, four zero bases of um, homology arm. And that's sufficient to get uh, an exchange to occur. And so this has now become um, was until very recently uh, the main way that you would make precise edits of a gene. So in understanding zinc finger nucleases, um, we perhaps need to look further back to what other enzymes cut um, DNA sequences, specific DNA sequences, uh, and whether we could modify them or not. So obviously, um, restriction enzymes um, exist in lots of prokaryotes, and we have a large catalogue of these enzymes which will cut a specific sequence. And the idea was to try and modify those enzymes so by understanding them, creating crystal structures of them, doing lots of mutagenesis on them, potentially we can take an enzyme that cuts sequence X and persuade it to cut sequence Y specifically. But actually most restriction enzymes cannot be readily adapted to cleave new sequences. Um, in general, they've got very short recognition sequences, which is not helpful. They, they'll cut many, many, many times in the genome and, and not cut unique sequences. And when you persuade them to cut another sequence, they cut, they cut them very, very weakly. Um, so 
really that wasn't um, a route to develop a genome editing. However, there's a class of enzymes, the type 2 S restriction enzymes, which are quite interesting. An example is the enzyme FOK1, FOK1. And these type 2 S restriction enzymes have separate cleavage and DNA recognition domains. And importantly, the cleavage domain has no specificity and can work on its own. It just needs to be recruited to the, um, the DNA. So, for example, here in the case of FOC1, which functions as a dimer, that's an important uh, feature of FOC1, it's a dimeric protein. So there's two molecules of the same protein in green and in blue here. And this domain is the DNA recognition domain. Um, FOC1 binds this particular sequence, GGATG. And then the cleavage domain is here. And a key feature uh, with this type 2 S restriction enzymes is they tend to bind in one place and cut a specific distance away. And the sequence that they cut, it doesn't matter. It can cut out all the sequences here. So type 2 S restriction enzymes are really useful in, in synthetic biology um, for, for, for lots of different techniques. But in the case of genome editing, we can take this cleavage domain which will only function as a dimer and add it on to another DNA binding domain. So we've got the cleavage part, we need the DNA binding part. And the concept was to fuse this catalytic domain of FOC1 onto a different DNA recognition domain. And when you look through the, the genomes of, of mammals, the most common DNA binding domain out there is the zinc finger domain. So, for example, there's nearly 1,500 human genes that have got zinc finger motifs. Um, um, and there's a large family of genes that contain a certain kind of zinc finger called the cis 2 his 2 or, or C2H2 zinc finger domain. And these domains, which I'll show you on the next slide, have got a very simple beta beta alpha fold um, and follow um, a very common um, amino acid motif. So these were discovered in 1985 and zinc finger domains were heavily studied in the 1990s and from this very substantial amount of work a DNA recognition uh, code emerged um, from comparing the, the protein um, amino acid sequence of zinc finger domains and the DNA, DNA sequence that they specifically bound to. So if we look here, um, here's a crystal structure of uh, zinc finger proteins bound um, to DNA. Uh, and so they bind to normal B DNA and the zinc finger domains uh, interdigitate or poke into the major groove of DNA. Uh, and all these zinc finger domains look like so. You've got an alpha helix and, and two beta sheets here. And it's all held together with uh, a, a molecule of zinc hence the name zinc finger. And then there are these specific residues on the alpha helix and on this beta turn here, which are the ones which bind to DNA. And depending on, on which amino acid, in the, uh, as you can see in this table, is in which position um, in, in this triplet here will determine which nucleotide is bound. And so, you know, you could actually look up through this table and, and, and create on paper which ideal proteins would bind to your sequence of interest. And indeed this is possible. So you can then create zinc finger nucleases. So zinc finger nucleases are where you've got an array of zinc finger proteins, usually three or four. Each zinc finger binds to three bases. So in the case of four zinc fingers, it's binding to 12 bases. Now, as I said before, FOC1 only functions as a dimer. So you need to make two of these proteins. So you've got to assemble two proteins. So of four zinc fingers with a FOC1 cleavage domain at the C-terminus. And FOC1 needs six bases of space um, to bind to and cleave. So your target sites are these 12 bases, there's a gap, and then these 12 bases. And there are tools to help you um, design these. Um, so 
key features of zinc finger nucleases is that the cleavage domain has no sequence specificity, so you can cut what, whatever you want to. Um, you do need to make two uh, ZFN proteins but this does increase sequence specificity, so you've now got 24 bases of specificity, which is pretty good. There are mutants of the FOC1 domain that were developed, um, which are obligate heterodimers. So there's a left FOC1 mutant, and there's a right FOC1 mutant. And what this means is that if one of these, uh, let's say this left ZF, um, ZFN protein bound at an off-target site, through its 12 bases, it wouldn't be able to uh, homodimerize with itself and therefore cut that off-target site. So by creating obligate heterodimers, you, you're really restricting the possibility of, of ZFNs cutting off-target. You do still get some off-target acti activity, but it's greatly reduced. The four times zinc finger domains is about as good as it gets. Um, longer arrays generally don't work. Um, so you're looking at 24 bases of specificity uh, at, at best. Um, assembling zinc finger arrays now is quite straightforward because there are wonderful um, synthetic biology tools out there to, to join fragments of DNA together quickly in cells. The real problem with zinc finger nucleases is, is the vast majority of zinc finger domains do not function very well when assembled together in these arrays for, for reasons that are not fully understood. So um, the best approach is to take a sort of mass action approach. And so the company Sangamo, based in California, and, and, and you can buy products licensed from Sigma, um, they had found um, zinc finger arrays that function well, and I think these are pairs of zinc fingers, and they've got pretty much every possible combination of pairs, and they found that these pairs are happy to be joined to each other. So they can create sets of four zinc finger domains for most sequences very quickly on a robotic platform, and therefore create functional ZFNs quite quickly. And so a lot of those function well. Um, but for ordinary groups assembling them themselves in labs, it, it, it really was quite a, a painful process because um, the majority of ZFNs you made just didn't function uh, anywhere near as well as they should have done on paper. However, if you've got a zinc finger nuclease that binds well and is specific, it's a, it's a superb tool for genome editing. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with zinc finger nucleases. Um, it's just the, the difficult to make if you don't have one of these um, huge assembly platforms available to you. Um, a key advantage of zinc finger nucleases is over all the methods that, that follow, um, uh, which I, I describe in this lecture, um, is that ZFNs are quite small. So they're much easier to d deliver into cells and tissues than some of the uh, more advanced tools that are used later on. So they certainly do have their place in genome editing, um, although you'll find in the modern era um, not many people use them. So ZFNs were first successfully used for genome editing in 2003. Uh, they've been used in many species for a, a very wide variety of edit editing applications. And a lot of the genome editing strategies and approaches that, that we know and use today were developed using ZFNs at first. Um, so some of the foundation papers that are out there all use ZFNs, so another reason for knowing about them. Uh, there are over 20 ZFN-based genetic therapies uh, that are going through different stages of clinical trials. Um, so they have their place, um, but the, they were slow to make. Um, there was a low chance of them functioning well, um, particularly when uh, created in, 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 in most standard research laboratories. And a big breakthrough came in 2009 when the DNA recognition code of a different protein domain family was solved. Um, and that leads us on to learning about talons in the next section. Transcription activator like effector proteins or tail proteins are. A, 
found in plant pathogenic bacteria of the genus Xanthomonas. And they're a class of DNA binding proteins which have uh, a predictable DNA specificity. And these different um, effectively transcription factor genes, that their role in Xanthomonas is to activate um, specific um, host plant genes to support the virulence of Xanthomonas. Um, and a key reason for these domains evolving is that they have a very simple code and they're very easy to mutate and adapt. So if a plant changes the, the sequence of the promoter of these important host genes to try and stop Xanthomonas uh, functioning and infecting them, then the Xanthomonas can change the sequence of their tail proteins very quickly. So what do these proteins look like? Well, they have these large repeats in them called repeat variable domains. And they all have the very same sequence, protein sequence, with the exception of these two residues at position 12 and 13 out of this 34 amino acid repeat. And the structure of the repeats looks like this, which is a helix turn helix motif. And these two residues are what specify which individual base each domain binds to. So the zinc finger domains were good because one domain just binds to three bases, but the tails are even better because one domain binds to one base. So you only need a library of four proteins and then you can assemble them in any order you want to to bind to any sequence you want to. So all the natural tail proteins have very long arrays of these RVDs and all these RVDs are very happy, they're very good neighbours with each other, so they're very happy to be assembled in, into longer arrays to create proteins with longer, more specific DNA binding sequences. So here's the RVD code. So um, depending on what these two amino acids are here in the turn, and NI will specify bind to an A base, HD, a C base, and so on and so on. We've also got a couple here which are non-specific um, or bind um, to G or an A. So these are incredibly powerful tools. So uh, in the lab, you've just got fragments of DNA that encode each one of these four domains or these other sp specific domains here. And you just need to assemble them together into long arrays and then put them into a longer protein. Um, there's very nice crystal structures of them, um, which just show how they bind, in that they just, again, uh, interdigitate into the major groove of DNA. They don't modify the DNA sequence at all, uh, the DNA structure at all, so you've got very nice BDNA, uh, very straight when you look down the end of it, and you just sort of get like this propeller of, pro of protein um, sticking out from it. So very, very elegant uh, protein. And you can use tail proteins much like uh, um, you do with uh, zinc fingers. And, but instead of having a ZFN now, you have something called a tail nuclease or a talon. And again, like before, you have left and right proteins and you create this dimer. Um, so FOC1 will only cleave as a dimer. Um, and the difference in the architecture of talons is that more space is required between the DNA binding domains for the FOC1 to work. So you have a gap of between 14 and 20 bases and FOC1 cuts in the middle. So you've just got to assemble two proteins just like before. Um, but a key feature now um, is that You've got much more specificity in the complex. You've got typically 30 to 40 bases of specificity. Um, and the majority of tail nuclease proteins that you make do function very well. Um, I would say about 75% of the talons um, that you make will cleave very well. And they're quite straightforward to assemble uh, in an ordinary lab. And, and I have done so myself. The kinds of breaks it, it creates, um, so uh, both zinc finger nucleases and talons, 
uh, create breaks with a four base five prime overhang and that's just what Fock one does it doesn't create a blunt end it creates a five prime overhang and you could use those overhang sequences if you want to in some strategies um, but that does mean that um, those breaks are, are a bit more mutagenic because non-homologous end joining in general will get rid of that five prime overhang and so you'll end up with deletions So talons were first uh, used for genome editing back in 2011. Uh, they've become widely used in many species for a whole variety of editing applications. They can do everything that ZFNs can do. Um, it takes one to two weeks to make them in, in a standard molecular biology lab uh, using the tools that are out there. Um, I'm saying here half of talons have got good cleavage activity. I think it's more than that. It's about 75%. Um, there's a wide, uh, the wide application of talons has led to many improvements uh, to reduce off-target uh, activity. So there's been new RVDs have been developed, which have got better base specificity. Um, there's mutations in the FOC1 domain to make it function as an obligate heterodimer, as I've mentioned. There are other mutations that improve the cleavage activity of FOC1. And there's been lots of changes to the architecture of talons um, um, to, to make sure that it, it will only cleave when the space is a certain length, which again improves its specificity because um, an off-target where two proteins might bind by chance, the, 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 the spacing's not the same. Um, so uh, it's a very powerful, robust technology for genome editing. Again, there's, there's really nothing wrong with talons whatsoever. Uh, they definitely have their place uh, and talons uh, are being pursued um, to final applications in, 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 a, in a lot of different strategies. However, like with ZFNs, you've still got to make these engineered proteins. There's a certain commitment to, to, to making these engineered proteins, testing them and getting them working before you do any genome editing. Um, and this is the reason why they're not used so much these days, because um, there's an easier approach out there. So in summary, I think the way you could consider zinc finger nucleases and talons is that they represent versions one and two of genome editing. Uh, these te technologies are very well established. Um, they're proven. Um, we know uh, what the limits of use are. Um, these endonucleases, um, these engineered nucleases can be very active uh, and very specific uh, and they're, they're quite a small payload when you're considering how to deliver them to cells and tissues. Um, but there's, there's a sort of barrier to entry um, for a lot of people, which is that that initial protein engineering can be time consuming and, and expensive. Uh, you need to make two proteins per target and only a fraction of what you make will, will perform well. Um, and, and perhaps a, a, another issue is that if you're wanting to create more than one break or edit at the same time, so let's say you're trying to mutate two genes at once or you're trying to delete a genomic region by cutting twice, in those situations, for two cuts, you'll need to make four proteins and deliver four proteins to the cell at the same time. Three cuts, you're up to six proteins. It, it becomes very difficult very quickly. So what if there was an approach out there where you could avoid having to make engineered proteins? And that's what we'll find out about when we look at CRISPR. <laughs> Clustered, regularly interspersed, short palindromic repeats um, is a very long acronym that um, is abbreviated to CRISPR, which is certainly a CRISPR way of talking about the adaptive immune system found in about 40% of all bacteria and 90% of archaeobacteria. And 
um, it was discovered from the sequencing of lots of prokaryotic genomes and we you kept seeing these uh, repetitive regions so in black here are all of these different repeats and in front of the repeats were all these open reading frames and so groups um, got into studying what these CRISPR loci were what were these clustered repeats all about and what it is um, is a system with which to um, detect um, bacteria, uh, bacteriophage genomes, detect and cut them, and also save fragments of those phage genomes into these repetitive arrays as a record of previous infection, and so you can target them again. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg situation goes on here, but if the CRISPR-Cas system has identified a viral genome and cleaved it and therefore inactivated that phage infection and cut it up into uh, small pieces, some of those small pieces, which are called spacers, get inserted into this CRISPR array. So all these different colors here are fragments of phage genomes that this particular bacterium has uh, has has cleaved before in its evolution. This repeat array, this CRISPR array, is then transcribed as one long pre-CRISPR transcript, a polymerase II transcript, which has got all these repeats in it. Those repeats, uh, well, each one of those repeats uh, binds this other uh, tracer RNA to form a double-stranded DNA sequence here. And then RNA3 then binds to this um, duplex of RNAs and cleaves them. So each one of these um, spacer and repeat regions called a CRISPR RNA gets separated from this pre-CRISPR RNA transcript. So you end up with lots and lots of CRISPR RNA, uh, tracer RNA, fragments. These are then bound by Cas9, and Cas9 is an RNA-guided DNA endonuclease. So these double-stranded RNAs bind to Cas9 and program it. They activate it for searching the genome. Cas9 searches the genome for short DNA sequences called uh, proto- protospacer adjacent motifs or PAM sequences. So each one of these spaces that we talked about before, these phage sequences, these spaces, when present in the CRISPR RNA is now called a protospacer. And Cas9 needs to find a sequence in the genome called the PAM, which centers it, 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 it allows it to sit onto DNA. Cas9 then unwinds the strands and if there's a match between the protospacer it has in its loaded CRISPR RNA, if that matches the genomic target, then the unwinding continues on and Cas9 will then cleave that target. So we can look at this in more detail. Again, we're, we're looking at the, the natural CRISPR system and this is a, a, a class two CRISPR system. So we have Cas9 and it loads up this duplex of RNAs of the CRISPR RNA, which contains the protospacer, which is 20 bases, which is supposed to match a phage genome. And then that's paired up with the tracer RNA. Cas9 then searches the genome for short PAM sequences. These are often just three or so bases long. And it then unwinds the strands of these PAM sequences and starts to see whether there's a match between the CRISPR RNA and the genomic target. If there is, this unwinding continues, this bubble gets bigger, and when it reaches its full length, and you've got this long R loop formed, so an R loop describes this RNA DNA duplex here, and, and Cas9 is holding the, the other DNA strand separately. Uh, when it's got far enough, then the cleavage domains of Cas9 are activated 
and the Cas9 systems used in most laboratories um, create a double strand break which is blunt ended and it cuts three bases away from that PAM sequence. So very predictable cleavage. So in 2012, uh, Jennifer Dudenis lab um, uh, and Emmanuel Charpentier showed that Cas9 from the bacterium Streptococcus pyogenes is a programmable RNA guided DNA endonuclease. And very quickly, the big synthetic biology labs out there jumped on this uh, and, and modified it in quite a simple but powerful way to turn it into a tool to allow um, anybody out there to uh, use short guide RNAs to edit their genome of interest. So in the tool that we use in labs, the CRISPR-Cas9 system now only has one RNA. It's called a single guide RNA. And it combines one end of a CRISPR RNA with the other end of a tracer RNA. So these RNAs are typically 98 to 100 bases long. At the five prime end, the 20 bases um, are the protospacer that match your genomic target of interest. And then you have the structural RNA that binds to and programs Cas9. And that's all you need. You need Cas9 protein and this short RNA. And so you can very quickly cut to your target of interest. There is nothing more involved. It's easy to multiplex plex this. So you could cut to many targets all at once, or you could create a, a large library of guide RNAs. So the only difficulty is expressing and delivering those guide RNAs into cells at the same time as Cas9. Um, just to home in on this a little bit more, um, there are two nuclease domains in Cas9. One's called the H and H domain, which cuts the target strand or the non-PAM strand. And then there's a RUVC domain that cuts the PAM strand, or you can call it the non-target strand, because it's it's not the one bound by the guide RNA. And they cut um, at pretty much the same time. The rough C domain does indeed cut first, um, but what you end up with is a blunt double strand break that's three bases away from your PAM. So to perform a CRISPR experiment, very straightforward, and you've got lots of options about how you would deliver CRISPR into cells. Um, and the choice of these is very much based on um, how easy it is to get started, uh, the amount of money it might cost you to get going, um, but then also what are the limitations of the cell type you, that you are using, um, or, or what specific experiment are you trying to complete. So the most simple way is to use plasmids that express Cas9 and the guide RNA, and you just deliver two plasmids into your cells of interest. Sometimes you can um, put the guide RNA expression on the same plasmid as Cas9, and you're just delivering one plasmid. That's the simplest way to get going. But you need a way of delivering plasmids into cells efficiently. And for a lot of primary cells, uh, that is not so straightforward. Another approach is to make Cas9 messenger RNA in cell, uh, um, in the lab, in the tube, and make the guide RNA in the lab as well. Um, so through in vitro transcription, and then you deliver those two RNAs into cells. And that's got the advantage of um, these RNAs getting to work very quickly. Um, uh, and in, in some situations, they're, they're easier to deliver than plasmids. Another approach is to use recombinant Cas9 protein um, that's been made in a, in a laboratory and use guide RNA that's been synthesized or transcribed in the lab. You mix the RNA and the protein together in a test tube and then you deliver that ribonuclear protein into cells. 
and, and this is probably the most potent way of doing CRISPR. It's the most active way. Um, and finally, you could also use lentiviruses to deliver uh, a Cas9 expression vector and RNA expression vectors. And the reason for using lentiviruses is that you could have a library of different uh, lentiviral genomes that encode lots and lots of different guide RNAs. So you could have a whole genome, uh, a whole gene um, library, or you could have a library of guides against every kinase that's out there in the genome. Um, and then you could do a, a mass uh, CRISPR experiment and select for cells with specific properties of interest. Um, and then those cells that you selected, you then sequence the lentiviral genome to see which guide RNAs were present um, after your experiment. And so now you know which genes might be important in your in your particular process that you're interested in. So a very powerful tool for, for performing screens. And an important thing to consider here is um, the level of Cas9 expression and how long it takes to become expressed and how long it lasts is very different depending on the different ways that you deliver um, your CRISPR into cells. So if you use the sort of standard approach of using plasmids or let's say a viral vector to deliver uh, a CRISPR expression vector and a guide expression vector into cells, then it takes very many hours before that DNA has made its way into the nucleus, it's been transcribed, the messenger RNA for Cas9 has been exported uh, to endoplasmic reticulum, translated, Cas9 is folded, imported into nucleus, and then accumulates. That takes many hours. So it's often 16 to 24 hours before you've got maximal Cas9 levels. And then that plasmid does often go into cells in quite high copy number and sticks around for quite a while even though the cells are dividing there's still enough plasmid there to um, to make Cas9 and so the CRISPR may go on for several days. If you use messenger RNA it gets to work quite quickly um, so it can um, get translated uh, and, and, and Cas9 can, can get to work in just a few hours um, Another advantage of messenger RNA is you can really sort of titrate how much of it is you, you're using in cells. So um, you can prevent overexpression of Cas9, which um, is a problem for off-target activity of Cas9. Um, and its expression lasts for a shorter period than, than what you will get with plasmid DNA. Um, and then if you deliver protein into cells, and obviously it gets to work straight away, uh, and it's the shortest lived um, uh, method of, of Cas9 delivery. So that Cas9 protein uh, cannot be expressed again because there's no messenger RNA out there. Um, and that protein will just degrade and um, dilute as the cells divide. So depending on these sort of four main approaches of delivering CRISPR into cells, you've got sort of different pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Um, which you can sort of read through later. But uh, in principle, if you deliver plasmids into cells, this is obviously the cheapest and simplest ways of, of doing CRISPR. And it's quite straightforward to express and deliver four uh, guide RNAs into cells at the same time. Um, but depending on the cell you're using, transfection might be quite difficult. Um, and in all these situation, plasmid situations, the Cas9 expression will persist for quite a long period of time and off-target mutagenesis by Cas9 will be at its highest uh, with this kind of approach. Um, if I just jump down to the protein approach, so um, using Cas9 protein, which um, typically you would be purchasing from a company, so that will cost you money, um, so you've got to buy that Cas9 protein. And also you've got to prepare your guide RNAs uh, through transcription in the lab um, or you're going to spend money buying those. Um, but the advantages of, of, of the RNP approach is that the transfection is very efficient. Uh, it's suitable for doing small screens um, and you've got the lowest level of off-target activity because your Cas9 is, is short-lived and you can titrate in exactly how much 
RMP you need just to, to get your target to be um, cleaved um, um, and, and don't use any more cast nine than that. And then the length of arrow approach obviously is, is suitable for these large screens and, and it can be, uh, length of arrow can be a better way of delivering uh, the CRISPR system into certain kinds of cells, particularly non-dividing cells. So um, just to point out that um, when you want to express guide RNAs in cells um, from a DNA template, uh, the way to do this is to use RNA polymerase 3 promoters. Uh, <clears throat> and these promoters are, are very useful because they're quite short, they've got very high activity, um, and importantly, they start at a defined base. So, for example, the U6 and 7SK promoters start at a G base, the H1 promoter starts at an A base, this base here will be the first base of your protospacer. So you can only express guide RNAs that begin with a G or an A. And then another key feature of polymerase 3 promoters is that they are terminated very easily with a row of Ts. So five Ts or more terminates uh, the transcription. So you can easily get these short transcripts that start at a defined base and are a defined length and you can express them in high levels. So how do we measure mutagenesis um, after performing CRISPR? How do we know that the CRISPR has worked? So all applications generally involve performing a genomic PCR um, of your target. So you've got um, oligonucleotide primers either side of your genomic target and you amplify that from genomic DNA from cells, your parental cells before you perform CRISPR and then from your CRISPR treated cells. And then you've got different ways of seeing whether mutations have occurred following Cas9 cleavage and DNA repair. So one way is the surveyor assay and the surveyor assay involves um, performing those genomic PCRs of your parental cells or wild type cells um, and then of your CRISPR treated cells and the key trick in this uh, assay is that these um, PCR products are melted so they're heated up and then cooled down very quickly uh, and so the, all those different DNA strands don't necessarily pair up with the strand they came with with the the sister strand they came from. So if you've got a mixture of wild type and mutant sequences, then you'll end up with mismatches between the, the annealed strands. You'll get these little bubbles in the DNA, and then you can cut those bubbles with an, an enzyme like T7 endonuclease one, which um, cuts mismatches within a, a double stranded DNA sequence. So it'll cut any mismatch um, fragments into, into pieces. And then you can run these digestion products out on an agarose gel. And through looking at the digestion pattern, if you've got fragments fall out, then that's because uh, CRISPR has, has occurred. Cas9 is bound, cleaved, and um, um, error prone repair has happened and the sequence has changed. So this is a very easy universal assay. Um, you don't need to have a specific assay designed for a specific target. Um, but I think what one thing you can often find when performing these surveyor assays is that you can get non-specific cutting of your PCR products um, dependent on, on how clean they are, how you prepare things in the lab. Um, and one thing certainly about the surveyor assay is that it does under-report mutagenesis when you compare it to other um, more sensitive methods. Um, but it is quite a quick way of, of screening whether uh, the CRISPR is working and whether one guide is better than another, for example. So uh, it's a commonly used assay. Another approach which is far more sensitive is the RFLP assay. So the um, same as, a, as, as I described before, so you're doing a genomic PCR um, of your parental cells and of your CRISPR-treated cells. Um, but in this case, you're going to digest your PCR fragments 
and you're not doing this melting, re-annealing thing. You're just taking the PCR fragments and digesting them with a restriction enzyme, um, um, which um, cuts your um, CRISPR target. So when you're designing your guide RNAs, you are looking at uh, what restriction sites overlap that site that's three bases away from the PAM for that particular guide. Um, that restriction enzyme will obviously cut the wild type PCR fragments, but if CRISPR has occurred and it's changed that sequence in any way, then that restriction enzyme site will then be lost, and so that fragment won't occur. And so by comparing the digestion pattern um, um, of your parental cells and your CRISPR-treated cells, you'll be able to see whether any restriction sites have been lost, therefore whether um, Cas9 um, has, has cut and led to mutagenesis. This is a, a really easy to perform assay and it's highly sensitive. Any base change at all um, will inactivate a restriction site and change the digestion pattern, which you can then quantify. Um, so this is the most sensitive assay I think that's out there um, in terms of a, a sort of a gel-based assay. Um, however, you do need to design a specific RFLP assay for each target that you're going to do. So if, let's say you're wanting to compare the performance of four different guides, then you will need to test four different restriction enzyme digestion patterns. So it can get quite complicated and quite hard work pretty quickly. Also, the interpretation of these gels um, can, can be difficult for some. Uh, it's something that I've found. So the easiest assay out there um, that everyone's um, pretty much everyone's using is called the tide assay and so again this is just a genomic PCR of your parental cells and a, a, a genomic PCR of your CRISPR treated cells and you don't do any nuclease digestion or any agarose gels you just simply send them for Sanger sequencing so normally you should get a, this nice clean sequence if cells are treated um, with CRISPR, then obviously at some point close to your PAM sequence, the sequence is going to fall apart and become um, seemingly random um, because you've got all these different insertions and deletions. And you often have to tell your sequencing company that you're expecting the sequence to um, sort of degrade at, at a particular position and that this is an experiment and you want that sequence because often the sequence company will think they've done a bad job and won't send you this chromatogram and, and we'll just sequence your, your fragment again and again and again and again. Um, so you need to tell them that uh, you're expecting it um, to look bad. You then take the two chromatograms here, your parental and your CRISPR treated one, and you upload them at, a, at the TIDE website at the NKI in Amsterdam. Uh, so this is from Bas van Steensel's lab, laboratory. That's a, a tool is developed for everybody. And what this tool does is compare these two chromatograms and it's able to uh, deconvolute the differences between them and, and call whether insertions or deletions have occurred. So this is a, obviously a very easy universal assay uh, for, for standard CRISPR. And what I mean is CRISPR that just uses a single guide um, it does underreport mutagenesis slightly. I would say um, 20 to 30 percent underreporting um, when compared with RFLP assays, um, and it certainly can't really deal with complex um, CRISPR approaches using dual NICases and two guides, which I, I get to talk about later on. So in summary, genome editing with CRISPR, you could consider this now the third generation of genome editing. It's incredibly simple and easy to use because you do not need to engineer any proteins and test them out. You just need to um, create these different RNAs to program the Cas9. Uh, Cas9 is a very efficient nuclease and it seems to work in all the species tested so far. It's very easy to make multiple cuts and edits at the same time just by expressing more than one guide RNA. The problem with CRISPR is that it comes from an adaptive immune system. 
and by that the CRISPR must make mistakes. Um, so for example, if a bacteriophage is normally being attacked by CRISPR, if it mutates its genome such that the protospacer does not match anymore, that bacteriophage strain could then take over and win the battle against the bacterium that it's infecting. So that bacterium needs to cut that new phage sequence to some degree. So it needs to have a low degree of error. Um, and when it cuts that phage genome by mistake, that mismatched genome by mistake, it will then record it. And now that new bacterial strain is then resistant to that new phage strain. Um, so there's this constant battle between the phage and the bacterium. Uh, and, and both need to be error prone uh, to keep duking it, it out with each other. So that's great for uh, CRISPR in prokaryotes, um, but that's not very good for uh, us molecular biologists where we want Cas9 specificity to be perfect. And it certainly is not. ChIP-seq studies have found that Cas9 stably interacts with hundreds to thousands of PAM sequences across the genome with any given guide RNA. So not just the on target, but lots and lots of off targets. Cas9 tends to not cleave most of these targets, but a small number of them will be cleaved and will end up getting mutated. Uh, and sometimes they'll get mutated just as efficiently as the on-target, sometimes more. These off-target sites typically have one to three mismatches uh, in the protospacer region. Um, so there can be tens to hundreds of off-target sites for any given guide. We've only got 20 of bases of specificity to begin with, um, so the fact that it accepts it tolerates mismatches of, of between one and three bases does mean that there are a lot of potential off-target sites out there. Uh, Large-scale studies uh, of mutagenesis um, have found that while some guides are better than others, there's no really reliable rules for predicting what will be a more specific guide than another, unfortunately. So there's, there's no real computational way of saying this is going to be a better guide than another, other than to say one guide's got less potential off targets than another. What has been found is that the first three bases of the protospace, protospacer, surprisingly, are dispensable for on-target cleavage. So there's only 17 bases of specificity required, um, and the first three of these can be mismatched. Um, and in general, it's been found that Cas9 tolerates more mismatches at the five prime end of the protospacer. And these 12 bases here, which some, some groups have called the seed region, are, are, are more specific and, and are more important. And certainly are going to be involved in those early stages of, of, of unwinding um, the genomic duplex um, and, and, and forming the, the CRISPR complex. So there are lots of tools out there for measuring off-target mutagenesis. Um, so groups have done ChIP-seq to see where Cas9 binds in cells. They've in, done in vitro site selection experiments, um, or they prepare genomic DNA and cleave it with Cas9 in vitro to find off-targets. And they, that, that does indeed um, stack up with what actually happens in vivo. Or you can do very clever methods which capture DNA breaks in cells uh, and you can pair, prepare DNA libraries of those breaks and then do high throughput sequencing and therefore sequence what's actually happening in cells. And all of these met methods have been really powerful in helping to describe off-target events in general, but uh, I would argue it's not practical to perform um, off-target assays like this in, in most of your experiments. You really need to avoid off-target tar off activity in the first place, if you can. So 
there are design tools out there um, for ZFNs, Talons, and CRISPR um, web tools out there that, that generate lists of potential off-target sites. And so some reach researchers, um, usually because uh, reviewers of in, in certain journals have asked them to do it, uh, will perform um, target-specific assays on a small number of, of those off-target sites, um, typically those that uh, reside in protein-coding exons, to confirm whether the, the CRISPR-mutated cells um, don't have mutations at some other off-target. Um, alternatively, you could um, do lots of genomic PCR assays on all these different off-target sites, pool them and send them for deep sequencing and then profile that mutagenesis on quite a large scale. So, as I say, I don't think this is practical for most people. I think if you're developing um, uh, medical strategies, so you're doing some sort of um, uh, gene therapy style approach and you're doing gene correction in in a patient stem cells then certainly there's a lot of pressure on you to to look at off-target activity and confirm that it's not occurred in your experiments um, but I think for most people uh, th this is is too time consuming so we need to avoid off-target activity as much as possible So how can we make CRISPR more specific? There's a lot of different ways. So the first and most obvious one is do not express Cas9 for too long or for too high a level. The off-target sites generally are inefficient sites. Uh, the Cas9 complex might not be very stable at these off-targets or the cleavage activity uh, may not be very high at these targets. So obviously, the more Cas9 you have and the longer you express it, you increase the chance of cleaving um, and mutating these weaker sites. So if you can, use Cas9 mRNA or protein in, in your most important experiments. Um, another quite clever approach is you could use, um, so in, in the sort of DNA vector-based approaches, you could use an additional guide RNA in, in, in addition to the ones that you need for your experiment. You can use one against the Cas9 expression vector itself. And so obviously Cas9 will be expressed and will function uh, for a few hours. But when it is functional, that vector itself gets cleaved um, and may well get lost. But certainly you won't be making any more Cas9 messenger RNA. So after that initial... A uh, burst of Cas9 expression and function, Cas9 will be lost. Um, and so what you end up with is, is quite low levels of and, and, and low persistence of, of CRISPR when you use a self-targeting guide. That's quite clever. Another approach is to change the guide RNAs. So as I mentioned, the first three bases of the protospacer uh, are not essential for on-target activity. So you can use what's called a truncated guide RNA where the guides just have 17, um, 18, or 19 nucleotide protospaces. Uh, the vast majority of these work at your on-target, but those off-targets are, are, are substantially weakened now, and so you tend to find off-target mutagenesis falls quite considerably at almost all of your off-target sites. Um, so that, that's quite a clever approach. Another approach is to use a dual Nikkei strategy, which I shall go through and describe. Or you could use an enhanced specificity mutant of Cas9. So this is an engineered version of Cas9 uh, where they've engineered out its, its loose specificity. And again, I shall describe that later on. The dual Nikkei's approach for CRISPR takes advantage of the fact that Cas9 has these two separate nuclease domains that cleave either the top or the bottom strand of your genomic target. And mutation of either one of these nuclease domains would lead to Cas9 being a Nikkeis. So for example, the D10A mutant, which mutates the catalytic domain of the RUV-C nuclease domain, means that Cas9 can only nick the target strand and it won't won't cut the PAM strand. Alternatively, the H840A mutant 
takes out the catalytic domain of the H and H nuclease, and so now this enzyme can only nick the PAM strand. So now we have a nick. Nicks are repaired quite faithfully in mammalian cells, so a nick in itself doesn't do very much. So if you nick your genomic target or an off-target, it will get repaired faithfully. You shouldn't get any mutagenesis. However, if you use this strategy, where you use two guide RNAs, and I've just called them A and B, and they need to be arranged in this orientation, so the PAM sites are facing out, and they're on opposite strands. These two guide RNAs will recruit the Nikase at the same time, hopefully. So in this case, we're using the D10A mutant, and it will nick the target strand in each case. So you've got nicks on opposite strands. If those two Cas9 nickases bind and nick at the same time, then what you end up with is a double strand break. But instead of it being a blunt break, it's now got a long overhang between those two nick points. So in this case, we'll have a long five prime overhang between this point here all the way to there and on the opposite strand, the fire prime overhang here. And so if you use the D10A mutant, you create five prime overhangs. If you use the H840A mutant, you create three prime overhangs using the same guide RNAs. So you have this flexibility now. So I'm just going to show this again, but in a more realistic scenario where the strands are unwound. So we have coincident binding of two Cas9s that are bound next to each other and they nick at the same time. Because these strands are already unwound by Cas9, the complex will fall apart, creating a double strand break with these overhangs. So it's been found that the tail-to-tail -tail orientation, as it were, um, of these uh, complexes is, is, or, or PAM out orientation of two guide RNAs uh, is the most reliable way of creating uh, double strand breaks using the dual Nikkei strategy. Uh, and this offset's quite important. If the two guides are too close to each other, the Cas9s cannot bind at the same time because they're getting in each other's way. If the offset's too large, then the chance of the, the two bubbles, the, the unwound bases in one com in your let's say your A complex and your B complex merging into one large bubble will reduce um, and so you again you won't get a double strand break you'll just get two nicks um, so there's an optimal window in which this works uh, but there are tools out there that have, um, allow you to to go and design the, these guides these dual Nikkei strategies uh, which are quite straightforward um, so when you use the dual Nikkei strategy, your on-target cleavage uh, is often quite similar to using uh, Cas9, wild-type Cas9 with a single guide. Um, it tends to be far more mutagenic than uh, conventional CRISPR because those overhangs often get lost, so you often get larger deletions. So in the case of making knockouts, it's a, a little bit easier um, with the dual Nikkei strategy. Um, and the key thing is your off-target activity is near zero uh, when people have looked because the chance of these two guides having off-targets that are in this arrangement somewhere else is, is, is minuscule. So here I'm going to show you um, a typical approach um, to making um, knockout cell lines uh, using a dual Nikkei's and that's this is something that uh, uh, an undergraduate student did uh, in our laboratory um, so it's very easy to do so firstly design your mutation strategy and this very much depends on your gene of interest in this case this was a transcription factor gene so we targeted the first exon which had the DNA binding domain encoded within it so this was exon 2 um, if it's an enzyme, you might target the catalytic domain. 
the only thing to really consider is whether your your gene of interest has multiple promoters and multiple splice forms because if you target the ATG or start site of one splice form you may not knock out another splice form which might take over so you might not get a knockout that you expected um, so what you need to design up initially is where to place your guide so you have an A and a B guide and you've used a, a design tool to help pick those out for you you design your genomic PCR primers that flank that um, and you should always do your genomic PCR assay first and just make sure that you're able to amplify that region cleanly uh, and, and perform um, your your assays and in this case for dual Nikkeis we prefer to use an RFLP assay to look at the efficiency of mutagenesis uh, you then need to, um, so this is a plasmid based approach, you then need to clone oligos that encode the protospaces uh, for your guide RNAs and you typically clone them into two uh, separate expression vectors which have uh, the polymerase 3 promoters in them. You can then choose to, if you want to, to then lift over these um, guide RNA expression units that you've created so for your A and your B guide and subclone them into your Cas9 expression vector to make an all-in-one vector. Um, the reason you would do that is that the efficiency of transfection of one plasmid is far higher than two, three or four plasmids. Uh, so with every additional plasmid you, you add to a transfection, your transfection efficiency will fall quite considerably. So there are quick cloning tools to clone in those protospacer sequences and to move over polymerase 3 promoter units into another vector. So this takes um, a couple of weeks to do all together and, and obviously it's only a, a small portion of your time in those couple of weeks. You then transfect those into cells. Uh, we're using electroporation in this case and our Cas9 expression vector co-expresses GFP and so we can look for the fluorescence of GFP and so this tells us what our transfection efficiency is and in this case it's about 90% delivery into the cells. So we know that at most 90% of the alleles of our targets could get mutated. We can't get 100%, at most it's 90%. So if you're only getting say 60% transfection you need to then adjust your mutagenesis that you'll see later on to that 60% number. You need to normalize to transfection efficiency to understand your CRISPR efficiency. And then we do these RFLP assays and, and as I warned before they can um, be sometimes confusing to understand um, but in this particular case we have this PCR product and we're cutting it with one of two different enzymes so individual digests this one cuts three times and creates four fragments. This one cuts once and creates two fragments. And we can see in the case of here that guide A with wild type Cas9 uh, works well because we've lost this restriction site that cut these two fragments up. So these two bands disappear and they're lost here. And you sometimes see the join of, uh, the, the, of these two fragments being joined together as in here but often this is mutated as well, so it will be a smear, it won't be a clean band. So the way to quantify this is to quantify the loss of these bands here. Um, and then alternatively guide B works because the production of these two fragments here is reduced and so we've got lots of uncut product. Um, and then you can compare those digestion patterns when you're using guides A and B together with the Cas9 Nikkeis. And so from all of this, you can then quantify what percentage of mutagenesis you've got. So 90% um, of the guide A target site was mutated when using guide A. So in other words, this guide was 100% efficient. Guide B, we got 75% mutagenesis with guide B uh, as compared with 90% transfection. So this was a pretty good guide, but not perfect. And then when we used guides A and B together with the Nikkeis, we saw 70% mutagenesis of, of both um, alleles. Um, so basically the dual Nikkeis is as good as your worst guide. 
And then to find your knockout cells, um, so if you can, you try and clone your polyclonal mix of cells. Um, so you do the CRISP, you do the CRISPR transfection. Uh, three days later, you then dilute out the cells um, to make a single cell per well. Or if the colony forming uh, um, cells, you would then um, plate out uh, in a dilute way such that individual colonies uh, would grow up from individual cells. You then pick those colonies or lines and then you screen them. And it's easiest to screen them for what you're interested in first. So in this case, we're interested in the knockout of the protein that we're looking at, which was um, VESF1 in this case. And we can see that of these nine lines tested in this first run here, two of them have lost VESF1 um, protein expression. And then uh, we've probably got two that are quite normal. And then we've got another five where we seem to have either heterozygous mutation um, or, or sort of frame or, or, or mutations which haven't created a, a frame shift knockout, but certainly have really um, screwed up expression of VESF1. Um, so it's best to identify cells which have lost your expression first, and then you do the genotyping on those. So you do your RFLP and you do your Sanger sequencing on those. So indeed, these were knockouts on both alleles. Uh, and these, these were also, also mutants on both alleles, um, just um, uh, not knockouts on both. It was a knockout and mutant heterozygous. So uh, another approach and a very sensible approach now uh, to doing CRISPR is to use an, an enhanced specificity mutant. So as I said before, Cas9 has evolved to be error prone and um, that enables adaptive immunity to new challenges. Um, and the way it does this is that Cas9 makes many backbone DNA contacts to stabilize complexes prior to cleavage. So Cas9 uses many positively charged residues like lysines and arginines to bind to the negatively charged phosphate backbone of your genomic DNA target strand and of the non-target strand to hold them in place. And uh, researchers use the crystal structure uh, and sort of mass mutagenesis assays to find out which ones of those contacts could be mutated. So you substitute that lysine with an alanine, for example, and see whether Cas9 still functions or not. And then of all those were mutants which still function, they then combine the mutations together to see whether they could get two and three uh, and four residue mutations um, and still have um, Cas9 activity. And indeed, this is what they have. So there are four different enhanced specificity mutants of Cas9 out there now uh, that have been created in different ways, either through sort of rational design or through a sort of screening-based approach. Uh, and, and this slide just shows two of them. So, for example, high-fidelity Cas9 mm -hmm. disrupts four contacts between Cas9 and the non-target strand. Uh, sorry, and, and the target strand, um, this one here, um, and enhanced specificity Cas9, ES Cas9, uh, has three mutations that disrupt contacts with the, with the non-target strand, and, and we have used this one. Um, so a key feature of using these enhanced specificity mutants is now they do not tolerate any mismatches whatsoever, and they need a full 20 base protospacer. So all 20 bases of that protospace are a key to on-target activity. So truncated guides do not work. Extended guides, if you've made a longer guide for some reason, 21, 22 bases, they don't work. Um, and mismatch guides obviously don't work. So off-target activity is almost completely reduced. Uh, there are some off targets in the sort of worst designed guides out there uh, which might still have some activity um, but in general off target activity is lost uh, when you use these mutants so if you can get hold of expression vectors for these enhanced specificity mutants or use um, recombinant proteins with these mutants then certainly try them there are a small number of target sites 
where Castellan activity will be reduced when using these enhanced specificity mutants. But by and large, this is still uh, a very potent system. So in summary, CRISPR has rapidly overtaken ZFNs and Talon technologies um, as new targets can be programmed without making any new proteins at all. Um, so that, that barrier to entry of doing genome editing has now gone and really anybody in any field, even people with quite limited molecular biology expertise, can now perform um, genome editing. Uh, CRISPR is becoming widely adopted in most molecular and cell biology fields. Uh, CRISPR is very efficient, but specificity is a major concern, especially if you use wild-type Cas9. So high-specificity Cas9 mutants are now available, uh, and there are also some um, very clever strategies um, to doing CRISPR as well, which mean that your specificity is, is greatly improved. It's possible to modify multiple targets in parallel, and of course you can perform functional genomic screens. Uh, so this is an extremely powerful approach for CRISPR. There are a number of CRISPR applications that require precise edits. So we're not just talking about knocking out and, and destroying and disrupting uh, the coding region of a gene or uh, the, the important parts of a gene regulatory element. So there are situations where you want to integrate transgenes or, or, or short sequences like um, epitope tags. So these are very specific sequences and you will want to put them in specific places. Um, also, if you're trying to correct human genetic disorders, you're wanting to make very specific single, double or triple base changes um, and you don't want random mutagenesis to occur. And a key thing to point out is if you look at the NCBI ClinVar database and, and download the 75,000 or so um, human disease variants that are out there, the vast majority of them are very small in length. So a lot of them are, so 30% of them are tr transition point mutations, so single DNA-based changes. Um, a transition mutation, just, just for reference, is where you've swapped a pyrimidine for a pyrimidine base. So for example, an A for a T, a T for an A, or a G for a C, or C for a G. A transversion point mutation occurs in about 20% of human genetic disease. And that involves an exchange of a pyrimidine for a purine base or vice versa. So for example, uh, an A um, for a T or a G for an A. <laughs> um, 26% 26 of human genetic diseases um, involve um, short deletions. And then there are duplications, and obviously then you've got larger changes such as copy number changes and large insertions and deletions. When you look at the deletions and duplications and insertions, uh, the vast majority of them are less than 25 bases in length. So most human disease-associated mutations are very short in length. And so if you've got a method to make small, precise edits potentially um, you could use that to correct the majority of human genetic disorders. So how do we make precise edits with CRISPR? So the first option, um, and one that uh, most groups are using to date, is to use homology-directed repair of the cell. So this involves creating a double-strand break and obviously you can do very large insertions when you use homology-directed repair, but you can make small edits as well. The second option is to use a, a, a new method called base editing. We're using an enzyme to swap bases over. Uh, the advantage of that is that there's no DNA break created. 
Uh, and then the third option is to use a brand new method which came out at the end of 2019. Uh, so it's only a couple of months old and it's called Prime Editing. And there there's no uh, um, double strand DNA breaks created. Uh, and it is unlike all the other approaches, it's capable of, of uh, making all kinds of edit edits of less than 80 bases in length, but at a very high efficiency and a very high specificity. So I should take you through each of these three. So as I mentioned in the, in the overview at the beginning, uh, homology directed repair uh, requires a donor DNA template. And so for the, in the case of a large alteration, like inserting a transgene, that's often a plasmid or a viral vector with your transgene flanked by quite long homology arms of 750 bases or more. If you wanted to make point mutations or, or very small edits, then um, your HDR experiment would involve a single stranded DNA donor template. So just an oligonucleotide where the homology arms are just 40 bases in length. So both of these systems work and you can get um, precise editing of a target. The problem is, is that error-prone non-homologous end joining repair confounds these HDR strategies because it is the most dominant um, repair pathway for the double strand breaks that you create. So the majority of cells that you, that you create after doing an HDR experiment will be random mutants and in the background is a minority of accurate HDR corrections. And a lot of your correct HDR cells will be correct on one allele and randomly mutated on another. So this can be extremely frustrating and requires a lot of work to filter through each of these cell clones that you will make to find your, your cells with the edits that you're interested in. So it's important again to look right back at the beginning where I, I mentioned that non-homologous end joining occurs throughout the cell cycle, but is, is obviously very high in G1 and S phase, whereas HDR occurs primarily in, in G2. Um, so one trick that can be used um, with great effect um, is to make a fusion of Cas9 with part of a protein called geminin. Geminin is a protein that is cell cycle regulated. It's Transcription and expression is not cell cycle regulated, so it's expressed throughout the cell cycle. But it is targeted for degradation um, by the proteasome. Um, but in G2, geminin becomes phosphorylated, and this domain that gets targeted for degradation is now resistant, and so geminin can then accumulate and function in G2 and M phase. So this is a post-translational regulation of uh, cell cycle regulation of geminin. So you can take that domain of geminin that gets targeted for degradation but is, is protected by phosphorylation and stick that onto Cas9. And this now means that the Cas9 geminin fusion, again, is, is expressed throughout the cell cycle but gets degraded, can't function, apart from in G2 when um, it becomes phospho phosphorylated and protected. So when you use this, you get a big shift in the bias of HDR experiments towards HDR events. Non-homologous end joining still happens, but now perhaps is a minority event. So now it may be two-thirds HDR and one-third non-homologous end joining. So this is a very powerful um, modification to HDR strategies. Um, so this is just um, showing an example uh, from one recent paper of researchers who are very good at HDR, and these are the kinds of outcomes that you might get. Um, so here they're um, targeting a variety of genes uh, with single base changes, um, or, or yeah, I think yeah, or, or here's a, a triple base insertion. So different HDR edits. And in blue bars, you can see this is a percentage of cells that have got their HDR edits in them. And in gray are the percentage of, well, that's the percentage of alleles that have got random insertions and deletions on them because of non-homologous end joining. So this shows the extent of the problem. 
So base editing uh, is an approach where you can make very small changes, often just to individual bases, uh, using an enzyme that will exchange, uh, that will modify the DNA base, and when it's replicated, it will lead to that, 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 that sequence being changed. So in this case, they're using a fusion of Cas9, and often they're using the Nikkei's mutant D10A, which I'll um, describe in a minute as to why they do that. Um, but they, they use Cas9 um, fused to um, a, a deaminase, and there are different deaminases out there. So for example, there's AID and there's Apobec. And what these deaminases, or ABC7, and what these deaminases do is deaminate, for example, an adenosine base and convert it to an inosine base. When inosine is replicated, it gets uh, uh, replicated as a guanosine base. So what you end up with here then is an A to G change. Alternatively, you could deaminate a cytosine base to a DU and that gets replicated as uh, a T, so then you get a C to T change. They use the D10A Nikkei's, and they're very clever about the design of, of which strand uh, they put their guide RNA on. And this is all to make sure that um, only the base edits on the strand that they're interested in get incorporated because Nick repair um, occurs on the non-edited um, strand. Um, so NIC repair doesn't create obviously any mutations by itself, but it's been used to bias how the cell either uses the edited or the, or the non-edited strand. Um, so the advantage of this approach is here using an enzyme. So the, the percentage of base editing is very high indeed. Um, um, I guess a, a key disadvantage is that depending on the sequence that you're targeting, it may not be possible just to edit one base only. It might, so for example, we're making a specific A to G change. There may be other A bases locally that will get converted to a G as well. And so we'll get other edits that we did not intend. So, so it does very much depend on the target as to how, how useful uh, this base editing is. But in, in some situations, it's very very powerful indeed. There's also a risk that this base editor uh, will uh, modify bases at off-target sites and that those will be quite hard to hard to discover. So I'm going to end up with talking about prime editing. Um, prime editing is an incredibly powerful approach uh, that uh, uses a, a modified CRISPR system but there are no double strand breaks uh, created. So we're not reliant on host double strand break repair. Um, it uses a Cas9 Nikase to uh, locate this uh, prime editing enzyme to your target site uh, and to prime the editing. The intended edit is carried on a guide RNA template and a reverse transcriptase is used to copy that guide RNA template onto your target um, and creates this edited strand. And then that edited strand is then incorporated into your target. So I shall take you through this in detail. So the prime editor again involves a Cas9, a guide RNA, and your target, as before. But there are three key changes from conventional CRISPR. So firstly, they're using the H840A Nikkei's of Cas9. So if this nicks at off targets, it'll create a nick, but those won't lead to mutations. And the nick at the on target by itself, again, won't lead to any change either. That in itself is just an entry point. As a reminder, the H840A Nikkei nicks the uh, non-target strand or the PAM strand. And so it will nick here at this very specific location, three bases away from the PAM. The 
the H840A Nikkei's is fused to a mutant version of the MMLV reverse transcriptase domain. This reverse transcriptase is uh, very well used in molecular biology. It's the one used in reverse transcription reactions when making cDNAs in, in molecular biology labs. Um, it's something that's been studied intensely. There are lots of mutations of it have been made to look at its performance. And so the mutant that they're using of, of the reverse transcriptase here, um, they've selected for one that functions very well um, in this particular um, architecture here. Thirdly, the guide RNA, which is the same as before, so normal guide RNA, except that now it's much longer. So it's a prime editing guide RNA or PEG RNA. And this three prime extension carries the template um, for the change that you want to make to your genomic target. So how does this work? So as a reminder, your all CRISPR target sites consist of a PAM sequence in the genomic DNA next to 20 bases that match the protospacer in the guide RNA. And Cas9 cuts three bases away from the PAM. In this case, it's just a nick, and the nick's occurring on the PAM strand. And that first base after there we call plus one. And what the prime editor can do is, is change any sequence after this point. So all the sequence here, including the PAM, is susceptible to the prime editing. So the reaction occurs as follows. The first step is the nicking of or binding to the genomic target, opening up of the strands, and then nicking of the PAM strand. So what you end up with is a... Um, three prime flap here of your genomic target and it is pairs up with your peg RNA so the the very end of the peg RNA that three prime end um, pairs up with your protospacer target and generally this primer binding site is 12 bases long so again, you know what the sequence is. It's your protospacer um, from the cut site onwards. Those 12 bases are placed at the end of the PEG RNA. So all reverse transcription reactions require a primer of some kind. And in this case, this three prime um, overhang here is effectively a primer for five prime to three prime reverse transcription. So now in the next step, reverse transcriptase adds on the edit. And the edit just might be a single base insertion or deletion, doesn't matter what it is. Here is this template. So in this case, I've shown a three base change in red. So the original sequence in blue and black, the three base change in red. So it fills in that three base change and then a short sequence that matches the rest of your genomic target which you want to be to stay the same. So the, the other side of your edit. So this is the non-edited sequence. And then a key thing is the reverse transcriptase cannot go any further into the PEG RNA because it's bound up by Cas9. So uh, the reverse transcriptase doesn't copy a guide RNA sequence um, into your genomic target. It only copies in what you've intended um, in your edited region here. So it fills that in. And then that's it. That's all this enzyme does. So it binds, opens, nicks, primes, and fills in. And that's all it's doing. So now we're hoping for the cell to incorporate this edited strand over the non-edited strand. So we have a three prime flap containing the edit in red. And three prime single strand ends are, are relatively stable uh, in the genome. Uh, there are no enzymes that will chew three prime to five prime. Um, so this three, three prime flap is there and the nick is there. Now there is going to be some breathing. This nick creates instability in this duplex. 
So these bases will unzip uh, at some to, to some level. And so there will be some equilibrium between the three prime flap and the five prime flap. Now, this will be the most dominant form. Uh, this won't happen very often. But when it does, this five prime flap is now available for digestion. There are many enzymes that choose single stranded DNA five prime to three prime. And there are many enzymes that recognize five prime flaps and just cut the flap off. So the idea is that host enzymes will excise this five prime flap and your three prime flap, your edited flap, will now come on in and hybridize through the bases that you've kept the same. But now you'll have a mismatch, a mismatch between your edit um, and the original non-edited sequence. So you've got a 50-50 chance of the cell when repairing that mismatch of incorporating your edit. Now the clever thing in the prime editing is that the um, have used a second guide RNA, but now it's a conventional guide RNA. It doesn't have this three prime extension on. So it's a second guide RNA to target your same prime editor enzyme to nick the non-edited strand. Okay, so this guide RNA hopefully is going to nick after the prime editing's happened. If it nicks before the prime editing's happened, Nothing really is going to happen. The nick gets filled in. It's fine. So some of the time, this nick is going to happen after the prime edit. When it does, the, 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 it's previously been found that um, by adding a nick into a mismatch sequence, so this was a, a, um, why it's used in the, the, the base editing system, as I've just mentioned before, is it biases the, the repair of this mismatch to remove this strand and retain the edited strand. So if you nick the non-edited strand, you will lose the non-edited sequence and retain your edit. Okay, so uh, in the best form of prime editing, there are two guide RNAs. One of them is delivering your edit um, via reverse transcription. And the second guide RNA is biasing the repair of the edit towards your edited sequence um, and so it, you don't end up going back to your original sequence. So this is data um, from this prime editing paper. So as I've shown you before, these are the kinds of ratios of specific edits you get from uh, homology directed repair using single strand oligos. Um, so quite low levels of precise edits and high levels of, of background uh, non-homologous end joining. When you use the prime editor, you often get around 50% of your cells contain your precise edit, and it is precise. Uh, there's no, no indels associated with it um, when the prime edit goes in. And there's a very low background of indels associated with mismatch repair that, that, that hasn't been accurate. <coughs> Uh, that occur at your target. And depending on how you design um, that um, second guide RNA to cut your target strand, if you can design that towards your original target, then, um, um, and you can refer to the paper for this, then this background goes down even lower. So prime editing is a, is a, a huge breakthrough in the CRISPR field. Um, it's got broad application. Um, because it's more uh, efficient than conventional CRISPR for creating precision edits. Uh, and it's got a very low uh, level of error as it currently stands. And, and obviously, it's, people are going to work on this and probably optimize it even more. A key thing is it can mediate all four transition point mutations and all eight transversion point mutations. Um, and base editing, the enzymatic base editing I talked about before, cannot do that. It can only do transition mutations. Um, it's been possible so far to insert up to 45 bases uh, using prime editing, so adding epitope tags onto the ends of genes. And also they've been able to delete up to 80 bases with prime editing. And uh, actually, I don't think they've sort of discovered what, what the limit of it is yet. Um, so on paper, this can correct 
um, around 90% of, of, of human pathogenic genetic variants in principle. So um, it's very, very exciting for everybody. So in summary, I've told you about ZFNs and talons and showed you that nucleases can stimulate um, editing of uh, genomes in living cells via host uh, double-strand DNA break repair. ZFNs and talons are most useful when small proteins are required, so when delivery to primary tissues is difficult. Um, but for most applications, CRISPR is far easier, faster, and widely applicable. And conventional CRISPR remains the choice for gene knockouts and performing screens. But now CRISPR can be performed with high specificity. Um, and prime editing is probably the best choice for the precision editing of genomes. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you found that lecture useful. Um, please let us know in the comments um, whether, whether it was good for you, whether there was something else that you needed. Uh, and please also definitely give us a like and consider sus subscribing because we've got a lot more uh, material coming up uh, and a lot of tutorials that we uh, think you'll find very useful indeed. Um, please also consider following us on social media, particularly Twitter and Facebook, uh, where you can engage with us and ask us questions and perhaps make suggestions of, of what we might change or, or what we might uh, create in the future. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you.